Hi, and welcome to the Real United States video blog. I'm your host, Paul Campbell, and welcome to St. Augustine, Florida, the oldest continually occupied city in the United States. Founded here by the Spaniards in 1565, I'm standing next to the Castillo de San Marcos, or Castle of St. Mark. Now, it's actually a fort, it's not a castle in the traditional sense, but it was called a castle because it was built here to protect a city. In this case, the city of St. Augustine. There were nine forts that preceded the structure you're looking at now. This is actually the tenth structure, and it's uh, built out of a native limestone called Coquina, which we'll talk about later, and uh, was in fact, it took 23 years to construct and was not finished until 1695. So now we're going to try and take you inside and show you some more of the fort. But we'll take a look at the cannons that are along here. We see here some of the cannons that were used during the era of the fort's use in the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries. And you can see these are actually have been remounted because they're behind the parapet wall. But some of these were quite large uh, pieces of munitions. The shorter ones are mortars, would have been used for short range, but large diameter munitions. And this was all designed as a defensive structure <coughs> for the surrounding river, the Indian River, or the Intercoastal Waterway, but it was called the Indian River to protect the Spanish interests in shipping in this area and to protect the city from invasion. The fort itself is built in a star shape and uh, you can see that it has parapets on the corners for defensive positions where individuals could shoot from those small holes in the parapets and you'll see the cannons lined along the upper wall that are smaller in diameter, but those would have been used in the defense of ground against ground forces that tried to invade. I was talking earlier about the walls being built out of this special type of limestone called co coquina. Well, you wouldn't think that uh, limestone would be a very good substance for building fort walls out of. But the interesting thing about coquina is it's made out of a combination of small shells from the coquina shellfish and sand that have been compressed together in sort of a cement-like material, but it's very porous. Because it's porous, it has kind of a sponginess about it that allows it to absorb a cannon blast without fracturing like a hard material would, such as granite. So it actually was ideal for making a fortification that was going to have to withstand cannon blasts because of its naturally absorbing properties. Now we're going to walk over here and we're going to look at a furnace that they used uh, to heat the cannonballs. Because believe it or not, what they would do is they would put them in this furnace and they would heat them up red hot before they fired them out at the ships. And here behind me is the, uh, is the furnace. It's actually quite a ways off here that, uh, that was used for heating the cannonballs. So they build a big fire in here underneath, get a big blaze going, and there's rails in here that they would load the cannonballs on and kind of stack up like bowling balls in a, on, a, on a set of rails and let them get red hot so they could pull them out the other end, load them into one of these pieces of ordnance, and fire this blazing hot cannonball into the side of a ship. So not only was there impact damage 
to the ship, but the ships in those days, of course, were built largely out of oak. So this glowing hot piece of iron stood a much better chance of actually catching the boat on fire, or if they were lucky and they hit the powder magazine, blowing the ship up entirely. One of the things you'll notice here is a lot of small pot marks, like it's been hit by small ordnance, small cannonballs. And what this is, you can tell by the pattern, is this, this was probably what was called grape shot. And grape shot was uh, small, like, like buckshot in a shotgun. It was a lot of smaller diameter uh, iron balls that were all pushed into the cannon at once and then fired out like a shotgun. And you ended up with this sort of a pattern that you see this whole wall has been just sort of riddled with grape shot. Now grape shot is not terribly effective against a fortification like this, but perhaps there was some sort of incursion here where there was a lot of troops and it may even have been the Spaniards that fired on the opposing troops trying to take their fort. It's hard to say. This small bridge I'm on is a, a bridge over the, the moat, or what they call the Sally Fort, which is a, a moat which at one time was flooded with water all the way around the exterior of the fort as an additional uh, repellent against invading forces. And you'll notice here behind me there's a nice little bridge that they've built over the, over the Sally Fort and a small drawbridge to uh, cut off the outside world from uh, invasion into the fort. So very much like you'd see in a medieval fort with a moat. This large covered structure right here is actually the well that supplied fresh water to the entire fort during its, its uh, years of operation. Now it's, it's since been covered up and probably was partially covered even at the time and they've 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 done a decorative uh, piece here in the middle by weighting the center of the well with a, a series of weight of welded together cannonballs these look to be maybe six pounders I'm not sure but uh, this is what where all of the fresh water for all of the troops and the people living in the fort would have come from it would have been dipped here by bucket by hand to, to feed this entire complex during the period of operation. This is an interesting piece right here. This is a piece of a barrel from what's called an 18 pounder. It fired an 18 pound iron projectile. It was a big gun. This would have been a piece of shore artillery. An 18 pounder, very, very heavy artillery. And this particular piece was found in the moat that we saw outside. And you can see here that it's fractured. And uh, according to this plaque, what happened is that this gun actually ruptured during a firing in a siege that happened in 1702. So you can imagine that the, and three or four of the cannon crew were killed in the explosion of this cannon. So you can imagine the, the tremendous force that it would have taken to rupture something because this, this wall, as you can see, is about, oh, three to four inches thick. So, and I'll convert that into centimeters and put it on the screen here for you when we get back home. But again, a tremendous accident. Three to four of the uh, soldiers died in this particular incident in 1702. Terrible, terrible accident. Here we have a beautiful little example of a piece of field artillery versus a piece of stationary artillery. This is probably a two pounder, maybe a four pounder. I'm not a, a, an expert in this sort of ordinance, but this is a, a beautiful example of the sort of artillery they would have been able to move around along the parapet wall to fire at oncoming troops or oncoming ships at very close range. Relatively small weapon, uh, compared to some of the other weapons we're, we're going to see and we've seen outside. But in excellent condition, very well restored. You can see here the uh, piece 
the, that's wedge-shaped for changing the elevation. So you would turn it for azimuth and move this block in and out for elevation. Here's another beautiful example of a four-pound cannon piece of field artillery, again, set up pretty much the same way where the azimuth is set by turning it and the elevation is set by a block which is tapered under the rear end of the cannon. So another very nicely preserved uh, iron, this is an iron cannon, not a, not a bronze cannon. Here we have an example of a, of a bronze cannon. We had shown you a, uh, an artillery piece earlier that was a piece of field artillery. This is actually uh, a naval piece. You can see it's, uh, it's not on two wheels where you can swing it to, to change the, uh, the azimuth. This is, uh, would be a naval cannon or in this case a fortification cannon. And this particular cannon is bronze. This is probably an 18 pounder and uh, would have had a range uh, probably a couple of miles, uh, three kilometers maybe. So there's quite a variety of different sizes of ordnance, but only a few of these cannons that are bronze, and you'll notice that they've cast the hoisting rings in very ornate patterns, fish-like uh, snake patterns on the top. They did a lot of detail even on the lifting hooks in those days. So, but this is all solid bronze. Here is one of the uh, bronze uh, weapons that they used uh, here at uh, Castillo de San Marcos. This is actually called a mortar. This is not a cannon. It's a short range weapon, but as you can see, uh, quite a large bore. This was probably a 24 pound or, or greater uh, steel ball that this thing fired. Relatively short range, it would fire it at a high arc for uh, attacking troops that were very very close to the fort so but this is a massive massive piece of uh, equipment works pretty much like a cannon with the same sort of adjustment but uh, but a much more short range and probably much less accurate weapon and now ladies and gentlemen the surprise that I have been promising you the firing of the cannons at Castillo de San Marcos Thank you. 
Now, video doesn't really do justice to what the firing of these cannons is like and what the sound is like, but since I like to have a little fun at the expense of my camera operator every once in a while, here's the reason you shoot this on a tripod and not handheld. We'd like to thank you for joining us on the Real United States video blog. We hope you've enjoyed this uh, short tour of the Castillo de San Marcos here in St. Augustine, Florida, the oldest city in the United States. We hope that you'll pick subscribe and join us above for future episodes as we have much more to bring you. You can always find us on YouTube or you can get up instant updates to your mobile device on uh, MoTube. If you have questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below. We'd be happy to get back to you as soon as we possibly can. And from this beautiful, sunny day in Florida, thank you for watching.